upstairs. If you get lost, um, Helen is at the counter and she'll show you the way. Um, and then at 7.15, we'll have time for a Q&A. Um, we've got some chairs just at the front here. Um, we'll have time for a Q&A, so please save your questions until the end. Um, and then if you're on Zoom, you can just type your questions into the chat box um, and our host inside will try to pass them along to me here. Um, if you haven't already purchased the book, you can do so after the event inside. And for those on Zoom, we'll paste a link in the chat box of where you can buy it online. And then afterwards, we'll move inside. The bar will be open and it'll be nice and warm. Um, and then we'll also um, have Antoinette at the front and you can get your copy signed. Um, and finally, if you could take a moment just to pop your phones on silent, that would be fantastic. Now I'd like to introduce you to our incredible speakers tonight. So we have our author, Antoinette Latouf. Antoinette is an award-winning journalist, media personality, diversity advocate, author, mum of two girls, and is terrible at reverse parking. She is all story. <laughs> She is also um, co-founder of Media Diversity Australia, a non-for-profit organisation working towards increasing cultural and linguistic diversity in the media. In conversation tonight, we have Katrina Blowers. Katrina is a Brisbane-based senior reporter and presenter for Seven News Queensland. Katrina has a keen interest in politics and has been embedded with the media teams travelling with leaders during election campaigns, providing coverage for the Seven Network and Sunrise. She is also a podcaster and author. Please put your hands together in a warm welcome. Well, hello everyone. It is so delightful to see all of you here tonight. Uh, we have had a few casualties with flu and COVID, so we are the warriors. We are still standing, so well done to you all. And it's also so amazing to have Antoinette in our hood, uh, Antoinette and I do a podcast together called The Briefing. We have had so many chats that it feels as though we know each other quite well. But this is actually the first time we've met face to face. So what an absolute yeah. treat it is. Thank you so much. Good and time. congratulations on this incredible book. The first thing that struck me as I read it was how incredibly well researched you were and uh, how well written it is. Not that that should be a surprise to me, but it's also really funny. Has anyone in the audience read the book? Yes, Antoinette's sister. <laughs> 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 okay, so to be fair, I sent her each chapter as I was writing it. I'd like, sis, what do you think? She's like, I love it, amazing. You know, that was the feedback all the time. So thank you for being my my cheer squad. Um, before we proceed, Katrina, I just wanted to acknowledge Eddie Sino was meant to be here from Griffith University. He's a lawyer, an amazing Indigenous thinker and advocate. He has the spicy cough um, and wasn't able to make it. So we're devastated because um, what I talk a lot about in this book. You can't talk about race and representation and diversity without centering Indigenous voices. So um, I accepted his reason for why he couldn't make it really. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to let you know that's why he's not here tonight. He says his apologies. So let's step back to when you first had that twinkle in your eye for this book. Where did the idea come from? And what was that kind of burning thing inside you that you yeah. needed to get this out onto paper? I guess I had a different trajectory. Um, to becoming an author than most people. I was approached by a publisher, not um, Penguin, but another publisher um, after I was on Q&A, uh, which is obviously a very great platform. Um, and I think it was the argy bargy I had with Marta B. Joyce that caught their attention. And they were like, who is she? She's funny and she just says what she thinks. Um, and so when I was approached, like, oh, would you like to write? Do you want to write fiction, non-fiction? I was like, I don't know, what would I write? And I had to think about it. Um, and then I jokingly said in a few conversations later because I wasn't sure what it was I wanted to write about. And I was like, I'm not sure what I have expertise on. Like, the stuff I say often makes me unpopular. Like, what would I write? How to lose friends and influence white people? And she was like, yes, that is what you will, <laughs> that is what you will write. Um, so it was kind of, yeah, a little bit organic, a little bit reluctant and not the usual way someone gets published. I know when you go about writing a book and you're pitching your ideas to the publishers, they often want a marketing plan. Like they want to know how you're going to promote this. Racism is an issue most people run screaming from yeah. talking about. So how did you sell this as a palatable and marketable idea? Yeah. Um, I think from the, from the tone of the very title, um, a little bit cheeky, 
Um, I think that spoke to the fact that, and also then seeing me on Q&A and the stuff I've said and done publicly, I thought that um, it was the combination of being bold enough to talk about uncomfortable issues, um, but warm and at times humorous enough to make it relatable. And so that's what I've attempted to do throughout the book, to be, you know, to be self-deprecate, to be very Aussie about it, um, but then to be really honest. But also the psychology of influence, which I've talked about and examined in that research, all that research I've done that you mentioned, actually looks at the fact that humour is a weapon in changing minds. People can get super defensive on stuff that makes us feel uncomfortable. Um, and so I think it was that ability to be human, be vulnerable, um, but also try and find light in some areas of our history, you know, both contemporary and um, you know, our very beginnings, our colonisation, which is very brutal and very dark, to try and find some light in those places. Um, so, Was yeah. that hard? Yeah, it was. It was difficult. Actually, the more I researched and the more I looked at the data, whether it was health outcomes, um, the disparities for Indigenous people or migrant and refugee women in precarious work situa um, situations, um, pregnancy outcomes, again, for refugee and migrant women, um, especially for Indigenous women, the more I looked at the, the hard evidence, the more I actually got angry, I was like, it is so startlingly obvious, um, but we've done a really good job of looking away because it makes us feel uncomfortable. And a lot of people like to think, well, I didn't do it. And I, I also condemn shooting black people. You know, people think that that commitment to diversity and inclusion um, and being an anti-racism is enough. Um, I, 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 that they were our ancestors. Why should I be punished? So no, it's not about being punished. It's about getting to a point in, and I think our election outcome probably points to this, that Australia, is looking for a different way forward. And I don't mean a Labor way forward or an independent way forward, but I think the election outcome showed that women, we wanted women to be heard. We wanted independent and new voices. We weren't standing, you know, we wouldn't tolerate trans bullying. Um, we wouldn't tolerate, especially in Sydney, the parachuting of white candidates into very diverse electorates and just elbowing the local Asian woman out of the way and just going, just going there. Um, like that is not going to be tolerated anymore. Um, and, and that is what Australians voted for. So I think we're at this really interesting juncture in our modern history where we are hoping and trying to find a fairer and better future, which is um, why I hope that, you know, the hope that I have comes out in this book. And, um, and the reason I wrote it in the way I wrote it is to provide people with tips and solutions because like climate change, you can go, oh, fine. Sorry, that's interesting. Um, this, is, this issue is really big. This issue is beyond me. This issue, like, what can I do? It's huge. Um, like, I'm just, I'm, gonna do I'm just going to do nothing. I'm, you know what? I'm not even recycling my milk bottle because I'm just going to go and binge on Netflix because this is all just too much and it, it can feel so overwhelming and you're just one little person. Um, so I've tried to provide every chapter ends with, you know, how to do this, don't do this, to try and be a really simple instructional way to guide people in what can feel like a really mammoth and overwhelming task. Uh, there are some seats out there. That was actually one of my favourite parts was getting to the end of each chapter and having those actionable takeaways because, as you said, it is, it is often a tricky conversation. And so for me to be able to have that primer um, is kind of like, you know, how, how to be a, a very open-minded and small liberal person for dummies, you know. It's, yeah. it's, it's a very helpful um, guidebook to, to having these difficult conversations. But you said something before about humour being a weapon. Is it also quite difficult to write with humour without diminishing very important subjects? It is. Um, it can be. And it is a, a difficult balancing act. And there were a couple of, like, Ku Klux Klan jokes I had thrown in, which my publisher was like, oh, like, we're going to take those out. Um, and, um, and what um, I also did um, was... I, it was really a really consultative process. So after I wrote each chapter, I had, including my sister, who always just told me it was amazing, thank you very much, but I had other far more critical um, responses. So I had um, a really good Indigenous friend of mine who read with her perspective. I had like um, uh, an author that I know, he's a middle-aged white man, so he gave me his perspective. I had a journal and I had a lawyer um, who was from a diverse background but not black. So I felt like I had different people that I approached who brought their different perspectives and I tried to get their, you know, get their feedback as to 
you know, am I, um, how does this sit with you? Um, have I missed anything? Especially because I can't profess to speak, for all people of colour, I can't certainly not profess to speak for black people. Um, and so ensuring that not only did I not conflate issues or diminish some people's trauma with the, with the humour, um, but that I also communicated and reached people that I'm trying to reach because there's no point in just preaching to the perverted. It's important to have your allies. It's important to have the cheese squad. But we don't really get far. We don't really instigate change if we don't change hearts and minds. So that's why, um, yeah, that's why I consulted so widely. Of course, I didn't take on all the feedback, but I, I tried as best I could to have an open-minded heart and re remember that this is hopefully a book for all Australians, people who want to be allies, people of colour and Indigenous people to go, okay, I want some tools, I want to move forward, I don't know how, and I don't want to be a jerk, and I don't want to offend anybody, and I don't want to be cancelled. Like, there are so many things to consider uh, when you're trying to advocate for change. I'd love to know, uh, it's something that's been quite interesting to me, is the whenever you promote a book, what the media chooses to focus on when they pick the eyes <laughs> out of it. And there's a particular story that Antoinette tells in the book about um, an experience she had with Kerry ann Kennelly, which got quite a lot of news coverage. Did that surprise you? And also the way that you write about a particular, um, I guess it's a bit of a critique of your friend Waleed Ali, and I could tell you were being so careful about it. You even said in the book, I don't want this to be the thing that, that gets publicity in this book. Yeah. Was it tricky for you? You are in the media. You do know some high-profile people. I guess calling out that behaviour and also not wanting that to steal all the headlines and take away from some of the other important messages. Yeah, that was really hard. Like, to be frank, I don't give an S what Caribbean can be thinks. <laughs> um, so that was one thing where I, I, you know, I didn't hold back. Um, but for Waleed, that was a trickier one because he is an ally. There are so few people of colour in prominent positions on air. But I did feel that there was a certain incident on air in which he demonstrated potentially poor judgment or problematic, uh, which I think anti-Black attitudes when he interviewed Lumumba and questioned the validity of Lumumba's claims of racism. The reason I highlighted that, and I also even talk about racism I've seen from my Arab community towards Indigenous people, was to show that there is a pecking order of hate and racism in this country, and blackness is always at the bottom. And what often happens in Australia is there's a wave of migration, they get all the, the tech, sort of the, the moral panic and the outcry, you know, it's the, the Greeks and the Italians and the Vietnamese and the Lebanese and the you know, Lebanese Muslims is my community for um, a long time, and then the so called African gangs of Melbourne. And often each way he was happy to go, Oh, here you go, it's, you know, we're passing the buck to you, um, and then retreating. Um, and so I wanted to critique my own community to show that we all need to do work, we can all make mistakes, and we all need to check ourselves and our communities to be um, better advocates for change and always actively anti racist. Um, and the reason I spoke about Waleed was because in a few interviews that came up, it came up because I interviewed a lot of people in the book, um, that incident came up again and again. And for me not to mention it would be me kind of concealing, oh, because he's a mate. Uh, he's a mate, can't talk about that, which is the same kind of thing I criticise, um, you know, whether it's politics or the media, when people are like us or one of our friends, we're more likely to be forgiven, wash away their sins or brush it under the carpet. And if I'm asking more from Australians and I should be prepared to do that work myself. So it was very uncomfortable. I was like, Lee, would you like a white writer's reply? Like, would you like to see what I'm writing? Would you, are we still going to be friends after this? It was really awkward, but it was such a high profile incident and one that I think I think was problematic. A lot of the, um, a lot of um, Indigenous thinkers saw it was problematic. A lot of anti-racism um, advocates saw it was problematic. And I thought, oh, it's, it's problematic for me to admit it simply because he's my mate. And I also talk about the fact that when Yasmin Abdul Majid was pretty much bullied and threatened and driven out of the country, I chose to stay silent. I had a, a discussion with a friend of mine. We were like, should we say something publicly? Should we stand up for her? It's so unfair. And then we were like, oh, they're going to come after us. Sorry, Yasmin. And we said nothing. And I admit that as well. I was a bad ally. I was scared. I was worried about my job. I was worried that I'd be cancelled. So I just think if I'm asking people to be really honest with themselves and do the work, I have to admit the nice stuff up. 
and I have to admit when friends and allies are nice to help. I would suggest, uh, for, from my perspective, I thought that was a very brave thing to do, to put that particular story in there, particularly considering that you could out of that and also, uh, you know, uh, put the spotlight on him and, and perhaps um, put some publicity in, in a particular part of the book where you didn't want that publicity to be shown. So I would suggest that was a brave thing to do. How can we all be braver every day yeah. when we do have the genuine fear of cancer culture? Yeah, it, cancer. it is true. And, like, I wake up every day and, like, look at Twitter and look at, like, some Sky News feeds. I'm like, oh, I are they all on holidays or something? Where are all the racists? Because I haven't been cancelled yet. <laughs> like I'm bracing myself for it, um, and I and I'm like, oh, I'm you know, it's been a month, and you know, so far, no death threats and no this and no that. Um, and so, how can we be braver? Um, what I I can only speak from my experience and some of the people I've spoken to who do advocacy work is to be really honest uh, about what it is you're trying to do. And also have some sort of honest conversations with yourself about what you're prepared to lose. I know that's a bit unfair, but I, at the time, was working at Network 10 when I uh, was just about to publish the book, and I left on great terms, but I had come to terms with the fact that I might get fired. I was like, uh, you know, I'm talking about something that happened on set with Carrie Ann, I'm talking about something that happened with Believe, which is, and just generally I'm uh, pushing the envelope on a lot of things. Um, so I was comfortable with that, but I was also... I knew that I had other opportunities. Like if you if you know that you can't lose your job because you can't pay your bills, you can't feed your kids, like it's a whole other state of affairs. Um, I took myself off the electoral roll so I can't be found. I ensured that my location and my children are not on social media. Like I took kind of digital safety measures. I had a digital security expert come into my life and be like, okay, I can access your PayPal account. I know this, I know this about you to try wow. and, yeah, to try and sort of uh, make sure that my safety was... Um, so it's kind of as good as it could be. Um, and then when, when certain, certain incidents, like the one I talk about, were lead, um, where I cared about preserving relationships, I was really honest. I had, you know, we had, I had conversations. I didn't just drop bombs, you know, like if there's something that we talked about, we saw the chapter, I gave him right a reply. Um, I did it in, the, in a way that was as respectful um, and inclusive as possible. But the other thing is people agree, just like not all white. Like people agree and disagree, just like not all white people agree on stuff, not all brown people agree on stuff. And so I thought it was a really important thing to highlight that, yeah, we can have a difference of opinion and still be part of the same not-for-profit and the same network and speak the same second language. There's quite an extraordinary story that you tell in the book about attending a very glamorous wedding. Uh, and so that in particular is, is surprising what happens to you and your husband, but then it's also the reaction that you get from a friend when you share with her, when you provide that incident to her afterwards. Would you mind telling us all about that? Yeah, so I was invited um, to a wedding, a beautiful girl, you know, kind, lovely friend. We've been friends for about five or six years. She was um, also in, the, in television, um, you know, very glamorous, very beautiful. Um, and her husband was a very successful entrepreneur. And when we got to the wedding, um, we know, I mean, it's something that you, if you're a minority, you'd notice that when you walk into the room, you would notice that I'm the only person of colour in the room or I'm the only Asian in the room or whatever. And it's not, it's just an observation. Like, it's just something you notice and you move on. Like, it doesn't, just is what it is. I remember my, I made the observation, and this is a very glamorous wedding with a lot of television types, um, her to be frank, and, you know, beautiful and look like Katrina, don't look like me. Um, and so it's just an observation. Hey, then we went on. We had a great time. Um, a lot of our mutual friends were there. We'd, I'd only met the groom once or twice, but I was quite good friends, obviously, with the bride. That's why we were there. My husband and I, so my husband's a tall guy, um, uh, dark brown skin, you know, broad shoulder, very foreign looking, even, um, you know, very dark skinned even for an hour. Um, and at the end of the party, we come wedding we come and congratulate the bride and groom again and the groom turns to my husband and says thank you so much for coming thank you so much for the music you did a great job and then turns to me and says and the girl's hair and makeup looks amazing you did such like the, the girls just look beautiful and I was like and then we might we just we just kind of went like what do you say it's the groom we're a bit shocked so we walk out I said to my husband did, and he's like yes 
he thought I was the DJ and you were the hair and makeup artist. <laughs> um, and so we were just so shocked. And in hindsight, I think I should have, we should have asked for payment. We should have been like, oh yes, yeah, so we get to be fixed up. You know, that's two and a half thousand dollars. Um, anyway, so that was, you know, he was, I can make excuses. He was drunk, he was whatever. It was unconscious bias, it was casual racism. He thought, you know, we were service workers, yada, yada, yada. That was the first, I guess, kind of bit of an insult. Um, but then, not an insult to be a hairdresser. Hairdressers are wonderful. Many hairdressers are in the room, but I am not a hairdresser. I was there as a guest. I was I was wearing a cocktail dress. My husband was in a tuxedo. Um, I tell a mutual friend who's always who's also a television type. And so, what upset me more was how much she minimised and discredited what I would told her. She was like, oh, "Is your husband standing next to you?" Like, no. Um, but your hair looked really nice that night. Like maybe because he thought you looked so nice that you also did the. I was like, no. Like this is just casual racism. This is unconscious bias. This is just because we're the only brown people in the room. We must be there to do a job. Um, like it's it's not okay. And the but did you and blah 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 just make me think these are the same sorts of excuses that women um, are often fed or given when they call out sexism. Or to call out sexual harassment. It's because your skirt short. Did you ask for it? It's because you looked really hot. It's just like, well, no, like, let's not deflect all you need in those circumstances just to be heard. I didn't need anything to happen. I wasn't filing a complaint to the Human Rights Commission. I just needed, oh my God, that was shit. Oh my God, that is so bad. That's all often people need when they when they face discrimination is just to be heard and believed. Um, and so what was more offensive in that case was the fact that it was just kind of discredited. I was like, there's no way you can, you can twist and turn that. He thanked my husband for the music and me for the makeup. <laughs> like, there's just no way you can read it another way. Um, so, yeah, that was, um, yeah, that was a difficult kind of little scenario. Yeah, I, I found so much of this book to be so incredibly eye-opening. For example, when you talk about International Women's Day, an event I am regularly asked to MC events for, speak on panels for, it, and I'm, I'm ashamed to admit it has never occurred to me to assess that most of the women that are on these panels with me, if not all of them, in nearly all of the situations I've been in, have been white. And you talk about how that makes particularly Indigenous women feel um, could you expand upon that for us, and in particular when you talk about microaggressions yes. and, um, and I guess how that really holds the, the feminist movement back? Yeah, so we all hear and make jokes about pale, stale male. Um, and in one of the chapters, I kind of extend that, like okay, pale, stale male and gale. And gale is a, is, is a white middle-class feminist. But the issue with gale's brand of feminism is that it stops with white women. Um, and so... There has been so much progress made by um, waves of femi feminists before us in Australia. Our, our lives um, are enriched. We stand on their shoulders. And I absolutely pay tribute to, to women who have, um, who have fought for so many of the liberties we now take for granted. There's still a way to go. And we cannot... Um, feminism has to be intersectional. It has to include the most disempowered women. And so, yes, we talk a lot about CEO representation and boardrooms, um, ASX 300 companies. And yes, women should be in those positions. We should have more influence, not because it's the PC work thing to do, but because research shows that businesses that um, embrace different thinkers are more profitable, they're more innovative, they foster a more, um, a more inclusive workplace. People stay longer in their jobs. Like the, the data from Deloitte and EY and every other um, Boston Consulting Group, it's like a mountain of research which talks about the commercial imperatives for why having different thinkers in a room is financially the right thing to do, as well as obviously. Um, but too often in Australia, the brand of feminism is quite exclusive. Um, and yes, it's important to advocate for representation at universities, but chancellorship levels and um, in boardrooms, but we can't forget the fact that the fastest growing prison population is Indigenous women, that Indigenous women are some 32 times more likely to be hospitalized um, for um, family violence than any other per, uh, person in this country that uh, refugee and migrant women um, are 10 times more likely to be in precarious work uh, situations which then makes them less likely to seek help for domestic violence or navigate 
a way out of domestic. So we, we cannot forget that for some people, they're fighting for access to the boardroom, but other and other women, they're fighting to live. And I just think our brand of feminism is, is so superficial if we don't um, if we don't ensure that it's intersectional. I mean, colour is one thing, race and colour is another. Then there's women with disability. There's women from the LGBTQI plus community. And so when International Women's Day happens and you see a panel of you know, four straight, able-bodied white women speaking about women's issues, whose women's issue are they talking about? That's not to say straight, able-bodied white women's issues are not issues. They are just not the only issue. More often than not, they are not the most pressing issue because for some, access to basic health care. For some people with disability, you know, access to employment, access to a livable, um, livable income, like access to live is still a, a daily fight. And I just, just think it's really easy to fall into this sort of middle-class feminism of, um, problems, which are still problems, but it diminishes and ignores other people's problems. And there was one International Women's Day event at Network 10, maybe three years ago, and it was all white women and one white man. And then I walked into the news director's office and I was like, International Women's Day. <laughs> like, international. I just kept saying, he's like, yes. and I was like, okay, like, we need, like, well, firstly, like, I understand sometimes there's a man at the table. Like, I understand that even in conversations of race, which is why I've been asked you to be part of these conversations, we need to bring in um, people who are part of the majority because change happens when, you know, we unite and, um, and, and work together. And then he's like, yes, but he has four daughters. Um, and it's kind of like Scott Morrison being the MP for PM for women because Jenny told him something. Um, there, and, and this stuff happens all the time and, and the people have blind spots. So there is this international endometriosis conference um, and the amazing panel of experts are 12 blokes. And I'm just like, who put this together and how did these 12 people agree to it without one person saying, Oh, John's and Adams on this panel. Like without somebody <laughs> recognizing that yes, there can be amazing obstetricians and gynecologists who are blokes, but surely at least one woman should talk about this woman's health. And these things happen. Very smart, capable, um, privileged people go into these things, and they have they have these blind spots. Um, and so that's why we we constantly need to challenge ourselves. And I've been challenged myself when the instances where I haven't centred or amplified Indigenous voices. I have um, organised events or been on panels where I have been pulled up and, you know, what about this? What about that? Um, I have a good friend, Lisa, who's here today, who constantly, you know, reminds me and works with me to ensure that my advocacy doesn't forget people with disability. Like, I have work to do. I'm learning. We're all learning. Um, and as long as we uh, admit that um, and keep trying, I mean, that's really all... All I'm asking for. You talk in a book about how it's it's a very common reaction for people to quickly go on the defensive. And I, I admit I have in the past as well because I'm like, oh, particularly when people have uh, taken me to task personally because I do look like the majority of people on television. Absolutely I do. Jan Fran, our colleague, shared a Channel 9 promo uh, last year on her Instagram and it had all of the presenters and I think I think you know if they'd featured 10 as a nine out of ten no they were all supposed to get the jab was all the, of them every yeah, single the person was the COVID one yes. yeah every single person was white right. and blonde yeah yeah so so you you mentioned in the book uh you, you compare it to the um the Me Too movement and that hashtag not all men, where some men got very defensive thinking that we were attacking all men, um, when in fact, you know, it, it detracted, that defensiveness detracted from focusing on what the actual issue was. Mm -hmm. How do we overcome our personal, I guess, um, bias towards, yeah. towards being defensive and how do we combat it? Yeah, that's a really good question um, because the natural reaction, as you've rightly pointed out, is defensiveness. And um, there have been some really interesting studies out of the United States which showed when privileged white people were shown um, statements um, of discrimination or statements showing people who were disempowered or who absolutely lacked privilege, the first response, rather than empathise, was to amplify any... Um, lack of privilege they've had in their life. So the first reaction was to go, 
but I was raised by a single mum. I went to a public school. I got bullied. We were poor. I have a big mortgage, you know, just to then centre, to kind of bridge the gap of what made them really uncomfortable to centre all the reasons and ways in which they don't have privilege or to diminish the level of privilege they have. Um, so that's a very real, um, a very real issue. It's a difficult thing um, how to overcome that. One of the best ways to, to really shift people's mindset is to be exposed to, there's this thing called counter, counter exemplary, counter stereotypical exemplary. And it's, it's a strange <laughs> academic term in my, I was like, what the yes. hell? And it essentially means being exposed to people who defy stereotypes. So, I mean, I do it myself. I went to um, uh, open day for my child's school and they said, oh, the principal's giving a talk in order to worry about free. And I was like, oh, where is he talking in your auditorium? And I'm like, she, she is talking in order to worry too. Like I even had that unconscious bias. Um, being exposed to people who defy stereotypes so that your, your only interaction with a person of colour isn't when they're your Uber driver. Like that um, joke at the wedding clearly only interacted with people of colour when they provided a service for me. Um, so some of the, the best ways is to challenge your unconscious views of what it means to have power, to have authority, and to have respect. Um, that's one way you can... Um, you can um, unconsciously have some of those some of those things challenged. Consciously is just to sit with that uncomfortableness. It's really easy to to quickly default to excuses. I think the sooner we, the first conversation people need to have with themselves is acknowledging their privilege. Like privilege is like a dirty word. It's like no, I don't have it. I'm still paying my car off. You know, it's just like. <laughs> um, it's just to first, in the first instance, just accept it. Like I accept that I am so much more privileged than the, you know, Povo Western Sydney girl um, I was growing up. Um, I have power, I have privilege. I'm also well aware of the fact that as a woman of an Arab background, I have a European sounding name, Antoinette Latouf. Like um, my, you know, some of my cousins surname were other slave men. You know, I know my, I have certain privileges simply because I have a pleasing surname. Uh, my good friend Susanna is here. She has an accent. We constantly talk about the difficulty having an accent um, is in the extra barriers that you face simply for sounding a little bit different. People speak to you like you're incapable or speak down to you. I know the fact that I have an Aussie accent gives me a certain amount of privilege. So I think let's just accept our privilege and accept that it can change over time and realise that where we are, often men, you know, middle-aged white men will go, oh, it's really tough for me. Um, <laughs> Um, and then I go, oh, okay. Um, it's not, but like how still <laughs> um, it's and I think what they're trying to say is I don't know where I fit in this conversation. Not that they really believe that they're disadvantaged, but they just have to exist for certain things, for certain doors to open for them. And I think when you identify your privilege and realize that that is your starting point and not your resting place, um, faith another wonderful friend of, of mine is a wonderful ally for people with disability, for people of colour. She, she, she knows who she is and what she has, but has decided to amplify and work with other people um, and use whatever power and privilege and skills you have. And so I just, I want, the one thing I would ask everybody when, if you were to walk away from this room is just to sit with who it is you are and what privilege you have. And privilege is not a dirty word. Um, and just use that for good, mobilise that for good. Because as soon as we get over that defensiveness, it's like, I'm not racist. I just wave to my Chinese neighbour. You know, that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of level of discourse we have in this country. But I'm not racist. Just, but I just think we should turn all the boats back. You know, um, that sort of. It's just like, well, that's not getting us anywhere. Like just starting a sentence with "I'm not racist," but does not actually get us anywhere. I know too a little white people, myself included, are sometimes scared of having these conversations yeah. or scared of weighing into debates, particularly on social media, because we are really worried about saying the wrong thing. Yeah, advice, please. Yeah, look, I've said the wrong things. Um, and social media is an awful, awful place, and I hope, I believe it's not a barometer for uh, Australian society. Twitter in particular, only one in five Aussies are on Twitter, and it's generally media... Uh, poli you know, pol political narcissist types like us that are on there. Um, and so we sometimes get lost in thinking that this is 
you know, Australia, this is a pulse of how people are feeling. So the first thing I would say, it, it is not. Um, secondly, um, to, to consult and to be open to um, people pulling you up on things. So I've had some people, um, there was actually one incident um, with the whole Will Smith, um, Chris Rock saga where I was like, oh, and I did my, you know, quick 20-second Hollywood take. Um, and then I had some First Nations people reach out to me and go, hey, Antoinette, um, this is how we feel, blah, blah, blah. And then it's not to say that you bow every time someone disagrees with you, but I was like, oh, how wedded am I to this view? I am not going to go down for Will Smith or Chris <laughs> Rock. Like, that's not, that's not my issue. So um, A to really, sometimes you can just quickly weigh into something that you don't really care about, like to go, do I really care about this? Um, to be open to discussion um, um, and to be open to making mistakes and owning it. I think yeah. we're, like, we're all one twin way we're all cancelled, yeah. but we really are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to be open to go, okay, um, I got this wrong. Um, cool, what can, I, what can I do from here? The one thing I would say not to do, which is what we often get um, in the, um, and when, especially when it's an issue of um, if somebody has been racially inflammatory or discriminatory, there have been some reality TV stars I could rattle off or some you know, prominent TV women to be like, kindness is a part of who I am, to kind of centre center your apology about how amazing you are. It's like, just like, no, just have humility and go, you know what, I misread this. Or this joke would have been okay circa 1997. You talk about that in the book. <laughs> you mentioned a couple of people who you'll have to read the book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you talk about the white woman pile on of all their friends going, but this person's really nice, you know, as though that somehow makes it all okay. Yeah, and like a lot of nice people do shitty things. Yeah. Like that's the reality. I don't think, um, you know, when we, call, when we think about systemic racism, I think when people think about racism, they think about people like yelling the N-word out of the car or, you know, like, or being like those overt acts of individual discrimination. And yes, they they exist uh, probably to a lesser extent now where there's torrent um, of those sorts of um, really racist outbursts, or at least I hope we are. Um, but it's the systemic stuff. It's the stuff when you don't have access to power, when you don't have access um, to, to good healthcare, to education, to breaking out of um, generations of disadvantage. That's the really, um, the really damaging form of uh, racism that we need to challenge. Uh, and so I think when people go, oh, she's a really nice person. She put a black square on after Black, you know, black Lives Matter. And it's like, yeah, I'm sure she is. But especially when you're in a position of power, if you're um, uh, in politics or in media or have an influential business role, you need to be held to a, to a higher standard because you are influential. You do have a megaphone. You set the standard. When we had, for example, Erin Mullen making, you know, awful sounds to emulate uh, Pacific Islander surnames and going, oh, that's just a joke. It's like, it is a joke, but if we, it, it, it's a, it's a poor joke. It's a racist joke. And, oh, but that's, you know, the footy show has been using that humour for 30 years. It was, it's been a bad idea for 30 years. And we shouldn't use, because this has always been done in history, as a get out of jail free card because in history people used to chain up humans and own them you know like well, there are a lot of things that people did in history that are hugely problematic um and we shouldn't use that as the oh but it was done before me i might pause for a moment just to open up to the audience uh who has a question that they would like to ask we have a couple of people fabulous we'll go to you at the front um the lady at the front first but i think it's one of the things going to take when we talk about diversity I think um, corporate Australia is doing a better job than politics, definitely politics and media, because they are looking at the bottom line and they're more driven by. Um, arguably more driven by the bottom line than they are with the socially acceptable, politically correct thing to do. And so, as I've said before, mountains of research about why diversity is. Um, so diversity is one part. That's what we call about diversity and inclusion. So diversity is getting people into the room and the inclusion part is allowing them to feel welcome, safe and um, have positions and pathways to grow. When you walk into an environment, you're just kind of like pushed into there and people are like, 
Oh, you know, higher, or you can't, it doesn't matter if you do something wrong. I've had people say, it doesn't matter if you do something wrong. I really need someone like you in television. Um, or, or they tell you a credit to your race or a credit, you know, those and those little microaggressions are the reason people don't stay. Or like just a couple of weeks ago, I was <laughs> so funny. I mean, funny, not funny. I went to the ABC <laughs> to fill in for a presenter. And I walked in and there's this dude, I can't remember his name, we'll call him Richard, um, maybe 65, um, and says, oh, hi, are you here to um, shadow produce? Which is like come in and just a bit more of an entry level, you know, and shadow because I come and watch and learn. Like, um, I was like, oh, no. And the, um, somebody else interjected, oh, she's, no, 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 she's the presenter. And I was like, oh, oh. So she just kind of looked at me up and down. It's like, I've been here for 30 years. And they only let me present overnights, as, you know. And then I was like, "Okay, maybe not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you're just not very good at it." But just the like the assumption that I came in as a shadow producer, and then the but I've been here for so long. I mean, what was it being insinuated was like, "Well, why are you allowed here?" And you, you know, I just if I gave more Fs um, to the children, I probably would have been offended. But those sorts of things happen a lot where especially with diversity it's good at the cadet level it's good at the entry like that like we have a mentor you know we have a mentorship program we have a, a first nations work experience program these things are all great but if that's where they end and there's mass exodus after a year and a half and there's no uh, editorial influence political influence actual thinking at, at a boardroom level then it's just that's tokenism um, and so what it, what it's going to take is a lot of work with middle managers, a lot of work with low sport like Richard, um, pe people just to understand that it's not a punishment to you. People, like people have people in the room actually makes us all better thinkers because like when Katrina and I um, are chatting on the podcast, you bring a perspective that's different to mine, simply from being a Queenslander, from having your background, from have, like you, and, it, and we, you go, you'll say something and I'll be like, oh, yeah, I didn't think of that. And that's simply by the fact that we bring different things to the table. So it's not about replacing all the Katrinas with me. It's just about having more of us in the room and we, we just bring so much more to our craft. And that, that would be... There was a gentleman in the back. Can you say your comment and then a question? Yeah, Richard. Um, I think it's sensitivity, both of them were presented by Indigenous writers and editors. We've two workshops on disability inclusion, and both of those have been presented by people with disabilities. Now it's only just the way to start. Mm -hmm. but it is to yeah, that's great. My comment is, do you think that the ABC is the presenter of this? Yeah, it's a really good question. And thank you for that comment. Um, I actually was asked this question because I was on a panel, an internal panel at the ABC just yesterday. Um, and I was asked this question. I think in some ways it's window dressing because you see on ABC News, on the rolling news channel, you see a person um, with a disability, a reporter with a disability, they often cross to. Um, you know, which, which is a step in the right direction. You see a reporter who has a, um, <coughs> his vision impaired, uh, visibly vision impaired. You see far more colour. You see a hijab. You see, and that is definite steps forward compared to what it was five years ago. And that has such, that has really big influence because this is the national broadcaster. All of our tax, taxes go there. And, you know, people with disability and brown and black people pay taxes too. So it is, it is our right to have Australians broadcast back to them. However, where they still have a lot of work to do, when I was asked how long will it take, and I say about 15 to 20 years, still the executive producers, the presenters of the hard-hitting sort of primetime flagship shows um, are still white. Um, yes, we have better gender representation, but that took about 20 years of work for more women to have those editorial leadership positions. Um, but it's not until you have editorial influence and have influential on-air roles, I'm talking at least Sales, Michael Rowland, uh, Virginia Trioli. I mean, other than Stan Grant, um, there I can't think of any person of colour who is in a 
prominent editorial, really sort of big, hard hitting, let alone someone with a disability. So it is a step in the right direction. It is a bit of window dressing, and it's going to take it's going to take time for change to happen. Any other questions? Oh, we're on a roll. Yes, please. That's really, really interesting. Um, for me, it was because of the people I spoke to in case studies I examined, like Yasmin Abdul Majid, like Yumi Steins, like Adam Woods, like Mariam Bazade. It was through their experience and their, their kind of warnings to me. I had someone turn up to my house. Yumi Steins had somebody go up to her child at the school after she made Ben Robert Smith, you know, he's got a collective grave to the bottom of the school or whatever. Um, Yasmin, um, had death threats, relentless. Um, she had people turn up to her house. And so I know that the climate has changed and I think we've um, gotten further along in the conversation, but it was Mariam Bazade who started the Islamophobia Register. She said, um, you know, I was sent bacon to my house. I was sent this, they found like my, my mother, they this, you know, and so I was like, <gasps> she was like, take yourself off the electoral. Like between you, me, Yasmin, um, and Mariam, I was, Nyadal uh, Nguyen, uh, as a black woman, uh, who talks about human rights and refugees and race. Um, she gave me a bit of a to-do, like, what happened to me? So it was, unfortunately, um, fortunately for me, but unfortunately for them, I had their experiences to learn from and their kind of warnings. Don't let what happened to me happen to you. Um, so I don't know um, much about this other author, but I, you know. Also being in the media, I think you get, you potentially get extra scrutiny. Um, I don't know. Anyone else got a question or perhaps an observation? Yes, just in front. Um, I, I just want to get your perspective on like the opposite side of it. So being an outsider in the two different countries, and like, like I've got, I am very privileged. <laughs> I've got a good job and you know, everybody's super nice. There's all this cultural diversity and everything's there. Uh, but still, because I come from a background where we always look at white people with an all. internalized racism and this belief that you know what, what it's a, it's a buy into white supremacy yeah and, and it's like it's not that they're doing that i no. know that they are not thinking that and you know they're not doing it consciously and it's okay. and they might not be doing anything at all be, yeah and it's it's like all in my head but that also happens a lot i yeah like what, what what's your perspective yeah look i to be fair, I don't believe, like, I don't feel I have expertise on that specifically, but what I think um, is really powerful from a media and storytelling perspective is we set up the good guy and the bad guy and the smart guy in, in our narratives, be it fiction, be it film. I don't know if you've noticed, but like every bad guy is Russian or Arab, like they just <laughs> always are. Um, and every, and I, you know, and, and it's, that we have a role to play in, we, we set those unconscious beliefs in, in, in what is, is good and smart and who is, um, and, and what goes back to that counter stereotypical exemplar, like surrounding yourself with people that defy that, that it can be a female professor and it can be like a really dopey white person collecting your rubbish, you know, like it's, you know, like I think it's just challenging 
those um, beliefs, which can be hard, particular, particularly if the messages around us in politics um, and in media and in marketing and in advertising are continually telling us what is beautiful, what is smart, what is right, who has expertise, who should be believed. Um, so, I mean, that's just one way to, but it, it can be difficult, particularly as you say, you come from, you come from overseas and that's also entrenched in your own um, sort of kind of upbringing or social structure. Yeah, I, I don't have well, a great question. Thank you for yeah. sharing that with us. I, I have one question for you, yes. Katrina. Uh, I'm, and if you don't like, be as honest as you like this, I'm very straight shooter. Um, how felt for you reading this book? Was it difficult not to be like defensive or get up or get upset? Or, you know, obviously you're um, a friend and a supporter, you know, that meant not today. Um, <laughs> but like, is it, is it a difficult journey for somebody like you to go, oh, I'm going to stick with this or stuff and I'm going to go from and get because this is all too hard? Uh, no, it wasn't a difficult journey for me at all. And I think the fact that I know you and it was so strongly in your voice helped me so much. So for me, it felt like I was sitting down and having a chat with a friend, albeit a very well-researched friend. Um, no, not at all. It's something I think about a lot, obviously being a newsreader, um, looking the way that I look, we at Channel 7 in Brisbane have one person of colour in the newsroom, which I've got to say is probably more than most newsroom, most commercial TV newsrooms. Um, she's a Torres Strait Islander reporter. Um, but, but, and I look around the room and I think we're not representative of the people who we broadcast to. Um, we don't have anyone with a disability working in the newsroom. Um, so it is, it is something that does play in my mind a lot and I found it, I found it very eye-opening and um, fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. There was someone up the back who had a question. I just wanted to know if you first got back to your uh, back in touch with the group and found out. <laughs> <laughs> No, we have it, but my husband's like, we are never going on double dates with them. Um, no, we, we didn't. And to be honest, I actually never told this friend because, like, it was her magical wedding day, and I just thought there are some battles, like, you choose, and that was just not one of them. I wanted her to remember it as a beautiful, magical day, not the fact that she married a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> so that you can stick to me <laughs> Who else do we have with some questions? There we go. Yes, you in the lovely beret slash. Do you want to stand up so we can see? cement close to you yeah. so yeah I think so and I guess my question would be like you know if I am pulling my black card in your experience like does it how do you like um navigate what is appropriate and then maybe like stay in the group as well like you talked about um, diversity but then inclusion so that's something that I'm still learning like to get into the room using my black card and then stay there yeah, I mean, there are a lot of um, people of colour who are reluctant to be on, um, you know, a, a special paid internship or or play, you know, uh, access via a black card or a diversity card because they fear, um, and it's not an unfounded fear that they'll forever be framed or seen in that light, or they will forever be their merit will forever be questioned. Are you here because you deserve it, or are you here because 
um, you had to fill a quota? I mean, that's a really difficult question to answer. And I think because sometimes you will be in the room because they have to tick a box. Um, and that's really unfortunate because is that a situation in which you can thrive? I guess it's what you do with that opportunity. And I guess it's what you, how you navigate forward and whether you will always feel that that will be over your head or next to your name. Because remember, there is no meritocracy. So people were given access to roles and doors open simply because dad golfed with somebody or simply because they went to the same school, they graduated as old boys to the same school. Do they walk around and ask, I play the white bloke card? You know, like, because it, like, it's not a card. It's just a constant state of affairs. Um, so A, see how well and comfortably you sit with it. Is it going to constantly hang over your mind and make you second guess your merit? Um, and B, remind yourself that opening, creating pathways and trying to level a playing field in a system that was unequal and unfair is not giving you, you know, it's not reverse discrimination and it's not giving you an unfair advantage. It's just trying to correct something that was unbalanced and unfair. Um, so, yeah, I guess my reminder to my, my pointers to you would be take the opportunity, provided you you can sit with it and you feel you can grow uh, and it's not going to determine who you are. Because I've often had to question myself, oh, I, I talk about this stuff and people are going to be like, she's the race hustler. You know, it's not what I set out to do. I'm a journalist. I'm a myriad of other things. Um, and B, remind yourself that it's not a card. It's access in, a, in, a, um, in an unfair system and that people, other people don't go, oh, I was, you know, playing the heterosexual card, I'm playing the able-bodied card. They just have the, those access. They just have that access when it happens. That was such a great answer. <laughs> yeah. Well done. There was someone at the back before, I guess, in the corner, Hi. and then we'll come to you. Hello, I, I, I love the dictionary. You sound like my sister. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a bit of a running theory that Australia really is so much involved in that we are so, I feel like, part of the stuff, the idea of being married. Mm. And when we say this stuff, when we say Australia is racist place and people like no we want to marry because they're nice people. How do we move beyond that? Because I think it really challenges national identity. Mm. But the truth is good people don't do gross stuff like that. But we really struggle with that we talk about bad war or overt racism. But how do we move past the whole of our identity to be a lot more open and understanding for more yeah, and that's a really big question. I wish I could answer it in two minutes or less. Um, but there is, there is this, you know, and there's so much about, um, and I guess it's part of the reason why I used humour and a lot of self-deprecating humour because it's a very Aussie thing to do. So I try to buy into that Aussie larrikinism because I feel that it's something we relate to and we pride ourselves on. Um, but part of that larrikinism is that we, we can see, we, we, it's muddled up into our racism. We, we use humour. In very racist ways, we diminish things um, um, by using humour and trying to deflect. Um, we like to pride ourselves as being, you know, one of the, uh, the most thriving multicultural country on the planet. Um, and there's a part in my book um, where I talk about ethnocracies, and that is where a democracy what's, um, what operates as a democracy, but when power is concentrated in the hands of an ethnic, one ethnic minority, it, um, it really you actually, which is the, ju the judiciary, uh, the legislature, the um, media and government, when they all dominated by one group, you are not a functioning democracy. And it was actually an, an Israeli thinker who kind of came up with that concept, looking at the fact that Israel positions itself as a democracy, but power is concentrated in the hands of Israelis and absolutely not with Arabs um, and Palestinians. Um, so I think when we talk about multiculturalism, it's got to be more than aid and food festivals and our favourite Vietnamese restaurant. I know who's, I know my, I know my sister's favourite. We've got a wonderful restaurant to it. Like it's, it's got to be beyond the surface level stuff. Um, and it's when you look at power, and I actually break down the, the metrics and compare it to, say, the UK, New Zealand and Canada, when you look at power across the four pillars of democracy in Australia, we are overwhelmingly an ethnocratic state. We are not a democracy. So we've just got to stop lying to ourselves. And we're just like, the proof The proof is there. We have never had a high court judge who is a person of colour, ever, 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 ever. How can we have faith in uh, the legal process in the justice system? So, uh, do you have a Supreme Court? Yes. Are there any rallies or 
just now, but that's yes, that's supreme but not high, Paul. Oh, that's yeah, true, but we're getting there. We are, we are. <laughs> um, so yeah, and so I think um, we've just got to go beyond and the superficial stuff. Um, and 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 for some reason, it sits so uncomfortably with us. And I think that's because um, because of our our, our colonisation and the ongoing impacts of. Um, colonization and the ongoing huge disparities in, in health and living outcome experiences we just want to look away because it makes us uncomfortable we also want to go oh, well that wasn't us like we didn't do it um and it's like sure we didn't but we benefit from it um, and so i just think we yeah it's a hard one your turn i love you thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I just have a zero. Um, I don't have my Yes. Oh, congratulations! Yay! <laughs> I have to say, I'm born in Malaysia. Yes. Yes. I get to try So, um, so I grew up in Malaysia where you do look at white people with white white people. There's actually a dude with white skin with white people. They want to be that very skin. All these products are, you know, it's white to white people. So I just want to show you Yes. I want to look at white people. Can I struggle? You noticed everyone's going to the solarium. What was that? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Yes. 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 I mean, and I was like, yeah. Do I take it off? Yeah. Right. Like, but, but would I make anyone feel different? I feel like then I've got this struggle, which I'm, I'm fine. Like, I would make it in the top of my hands. Like, then the honest like, yeah. I mean, I um, have never worn uh, a, head, a headscarf, but I also know. I talk about privilege, that's a privilege. I would never have gotten a job in commercial television if I hadn't worn a headscarf. I know that to be absolutely true. Um, I was actually at a writer's festival on the Central Coast of New South Wales just on the weekend with an author, Amani Hader, who's written an amazing book, The Mother Wound. Please read it. She's an amazing story. Just before we went, we, we were talking about she's a lawyer. Uh, she put on the hijab later on in life, so she'd started her career in law. She talks about the different treatment she was given, she, the different rooms that were open to her, the lunches she was invited to the access she had and how much that changed once she put that on. I don't I don't need to frighten you and I can't speak from personal experience. I just had this conversation just a few short days ago. Um, it is a barrier, unfortunately, because it is a visible sign of difference. But I, it's not to say that you can't, you know, um, thrive and overcome it. I just think it's something you probably should be conscious of and speak to other women um, for advice, I'm limited in what I can say other than sharing other people's experiences. But I'm not going to go, oh, it's okay, we don't need anything. I don't see colour, we do. You know, unless you're clinically colourblind, we all see colour. Um, and it's, um, I, I'd be lying to you if I if I thought. Um, actually, I can put you in touch with Marriott who um, started the Islamophobia Register because it is women who are visibly Muslim that get attacked verbally and physically the most. Um, in Australia, unfortunately. But also, you just shared that with me. I'd like to share with you that by you being vulnerable and speaking about that, that has actually made me feel much more connected to you. So I think it's really important mm. to, to talk openly about this stuff, as difficult as it is. So thank you. I think we are about at the end of our time here. So I would just like to conclude by asking you, Antoinette, one tip, one tip that you can share with us. What's one thing we can do is it's yes. night? Or first thing in the morning to begin our allyship journey. 
Okay, well, I usually give two tips, but I've already given one about the identify your privilege and sit with it. It's your starting place, it's not your resting place. The second thing I would say is find your niche. What, it, what is it exactly that you can champion and you have within your skills and your time to change? It can be really hard to go, how am I going to stop deaths in custody? How am I going to stop Islamophobic attacks on women? Like, how am I as one person going to do it? I would say find one thing that you have interest in, you have some experience in. It could be at the local sports club. It could be in the workplace. It could be at a high school, a children's high school, something where um, it can be specific to one cultural group. Newly arrived uh, people from Afghanistan fleeing the Taliban. Something that you can do that can help change people's lives and provide them pathways you know, to full participation in Australia's democracy. Don't feel that you single-handedly need to dismantle 240 years of systemic black racism due to colonisation because you're just going to go, you know what, I tried that for four days. It was really hard. Um, and I'm just not doing, I'm not doing, and I posted lots on Twitter and I shared a lot, on, lots of black squares on Instagram and it was just nothing changed. Um, so just um, find, find your niche because it'd be so much easier to stick to it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming. I was like, oh, is anyone going to turn up and talk about race? Um, <laughs> um, and so I had, I had that feeling that you have before you have a throat, like throwing a party. Like, is anyone going to come have enough food? Do they really like me. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really honoured that you're all here. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.